got to read about my own sinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happened to me in North Africa. Did it really? Yeah, same thing. No, the thing uh, on wartime coverage in the news media, and I rely on uh, on the radio stuff and my uh, my computer. Uh, believe it or not, but I don't even own a TV. Uh, I don't find much on TV that's worth the electricity, to tell you the truth. But uh, the thing that irritates me is that there are very, very few people in the news media in this country who have ever been in the armed forces, and they talk about things that they don't know one damn thing about. <laughs> and that's the thing that bothers me. I ignore it. You have coverage during the war, during the fog of war. So imagine you are a correspondent, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and you've got to get a story out. You have a deadline. So there's three people you could talk to you can be certain don't know what's going on. The guy in the foxhole, the guy in the airplane, and the general. <laughs> None of them have a clue. <laughs> So you go back and you do history, as Ken Burns did, and you stitch things together, and you begin to figure out what really happened. Yep. Because in the meantime, it's just a story to fill the paper for the time. I say this as a former combat correspondent. So. Well, you know, in, in combat, you know what's going on in front of you. That's Other it. than that, you don't, <laughs> you don't know anything. <laughs> Right, you know what's coming at you. And you don't even know all of that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know some of it. Yeah. The reason I do so much talking around is that there are less than 500,000 World War II veterans still alive. We lose 400 every day. So our, our numbers are dropping every day. Uh, we, we went over. I'll give you an idea of how, what I give in my talks. The first thing I do is, is uh, tell how the World War, World War II affected the people in the United States. And then I go on to my own particular, uh, there are some things that people just don't know, like uh, for instance, a Japanese sub surfacing in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, shooting up a couple of, of, uh, of businesses in there. And the same thing, what we, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, uh, people don't know that we were afraid of a German invasion. And so we had uh, every house that was on the beach had to have <clears throat> nightshades. Mm -hmm. They didn't pull them down. They had wardens who came around and, and warned you and then uh, charged you. Mm -hmm. And we also trained women to drive two and a half ton GI trucks without any lights. So if we were invaded, they would be able to, to uh, uh, drive drivers around. And going overseas, I, I take the the people then through my basic training, and there's some harrowing things in basic training that people just don't know we do, like uh, uh, going under barbed wire with a live ammunition over your head. You don't dare open your head, open your, uh, get your head up. And the same thing with, um, with, uh, getting in a foxhole and have, a, have a, a tank run over the top of your 
in, in 20 mile force marches and being able to take apart your weapon and clean it and put it back together again with blindfolds on because they don't have lamps in foxholes. And so this is all training. I went over uh, on a Cunard line, the sister ship of the Queen Elizabeth, and we were stacked five bunks on top of each other. And 90% of the, of the, the 6,000 on that ship were had never been on the ocean before. And uh, it was, they got sick all the time. The poor guys who didn't get sick were the ones who had to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> and we, um, we didn't have any escort going across the ocean. So every time it zigged, it rolled one way, and every time it zagged, it rolled the other way. So eight days of doing that, and we finally landed at Firth of Forth in Scotland, because it was a big ship. I trained down to Southampton in crossing the, uh, the English Channel, and in an English ship, where our rations were a loaf of bread and a pot of tea every day. And they would go a little ahead and then they'd detect the U-boat, <clears throat> they'd back up, they'd go a little, and they kept doing that. And so when we got to France, we went to La Havre, because that was the safest place to land in. And meanwhile, uh, didn't say that because a lot of people, a lot of GIs had claustrophobia. And we had one hammock for 200 of us in a hold of the ship. And uh, we had to sleep on the steel plates. And they'd have to come down every few hours and take somebody in a gurney up because they couldn't stand it anymore with claustrophobia. We got over to Atlanta de La Havre, and they said, you walk up this mountain, and there's a cot there, and uh, a real hot meal. So we walked up the mountain, got the hot meal, lay down in a cot. Half an hour later, we walked, we got down the mountain, and got on 40 and 8s. 40 and 8s is a, uh, 40, 40 men or eight horses in a box car. And, it's, and uh, if you, you had to relieve yourself while you're on this box car, you picked a real good friend and they held your belt, you leaned over the side. <laughs> and, uh, and then they took you right to the front. <laughs> Now, once you guys got to the front, you were distinguished against uh, the enemies you were fighting against in a really interesting way I, I'd like to invite you to comment on. If a, Russia, if a German tank broke down, it was just parked. If a Russian tank broke down, it was parked. But if American equipment broke down, my understanding is you guys could fix it. Do you want to, anybody want to comment on that? Well, sure. We went and got them and hauled them to the rear. They were repaired. You took new ones forward. So lots of equipment available just to keep it moving. Yeah. In fact, that's what I did in Italy. I went out and found tanks that had been damaged, checked for removed mines, took the recovery crew up, helped them recover, pulled it back out so we could repair it, take new ones up. When you were... <laughs> Uh, excuse me, I'd like to backtrack a bit. They're talking about going overseas on the ships. The, the ship from New York to Iran, uh, Algeria, wasn't bad. We had 1,500 more troops aboard than they had bunks for. So my platoon, we volunteered, although we were supposed to rotate through where they had bunks. We went down below, so how stuffy and everything to troop areas were, so we volunteered to stay off, 
on deck. But when we went from Oran to uh, the beach of Sorno, we were on a, an Indian. And I don't know why, after all these years, I remember the name of that tub. Uh, it was His Majesty's Indian Ship Corolla. It was the safest ship in the convoy because the plates were so thin, a torpedo could have gone through both sides without detonating. <laughs> <laughs> this, this thing, and we, we had hammocks, and we decided it would be much better to sleep on deck. <laughs> and the, uh, the food was, uh, we had been issued three days rations, and the food, uh, each squad was issued a, uh, a ten uh, uh, wash tub, uh, a dishwasher tub, uh, a big uh, a coffee pot, about like so, and uh, a, a big serving spoon and a fork. So you went down to the, uh, the galley and they threw grub in the, in the wash pan. <laughs> you took it back to where your squad was and dished it up, and then you washed the you know, stuff in. There was a cold water, cold salt water tap uh, down by the galley that you washed it out. And so we didn't know what was gonna happen when we got to the beach, but we were very glad to get off that tub. And the story was that it had not been back in a British port since the end of the First World War, because the owners knew that if it got into a British port, it would be condemned. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, no I won't. I, I was going to tell no, I, I was going to, yeah, I'll tell you about the, <laughs> <laughs> the latrine facilities. Wow. The latrine facilities were hanging over the side on the stern of the ship. Uh, on each side was about a, a three or a four holder, <laughs> and you know what that is. <laughs> and so the ship hadn't been in a British port since the end of the First World War. I don't think they'd been clean since then. <laughs> anyway, but uh, we, uh, we, were, we were very pleased to go over the side <laughs> and get, uh, get ashore. We were on the Queen Elizabeth. They, now think of this, 17,000 troops. So we ate in shifts. They ate all day long. And, and you'd, you'd be assigned a certain time to eat. I, I was an officer and first lieutenant, and I got assigned a packet of men. We drew straws, and two guys would draw a straw, whether we, whether we were going to be loose on the ship and just pull officer of the day or officer of the guard, or be a commander, temporary commander of this. And they were equivalent of two army companies, about 500 men. And I lost, so I, <laughs> I, had, I had to command these guys I'd never seen before. Camp Shanks, New York, all until we got to England. And uh, when we got out on the ship, the food was so terrible. We had two meals a day, not three, two. And the food was so bad, it was awful. <laughs> well, we found out that the guys that had to pull off sort of the guard had a black armband. If you had that black armband, you could get tea and nut bread. <laughs> and the rest of us that couldn't, that, that didn't get off sort of the guard, would bid on those things. Everybody's short of money, and so we bid on those things. If you, you, you'd bid to get the guys OG, so you could go have some tea and talk with it. Wow. <laughs> you know, on the job, and there I was on the uh, steam SS Santa Paula. It was a Grace Line uh, combination passenger and banana boat, uh, and uh, again two meals a day. So one day, breakfast would be. It was 0400 in the morning. And maybe around noon, you would get uh, an apple and a Dixie cup of ice cream. And then, if you were lucky, you got supper at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. If you weren't, which seemed to be usual, because you had breakfast at 0400, you'd have supper at 0800. <laughs> but, uh, and then when the uh, uh, the mess hall, there was the, what had been the dining room on this passenger ship. There were stand-up tables, and the, uh, 
the ceiling of it was retractable. So during the day, they'd have it open. This was in uh, May of uh, 43. So it was comfortable, but as soon as it got dark, that was closed up, of course. <laughs> and it was like an oven in there. And then uh, uh, the, uh, oh, and also uh, to get the apple and, uh, and Dixie cup of ice cream uh, around noon, you go a long thing and, and uh, a guy would stick his arm out of a porthole and hand you an apple and the next porthole a guy would hand you a Dixie cup of ice cream. <laughs> and then if you had shots that had uh, the same thing, a guy would uh, stick his hand with his needle out through the porthole and jab you in the arm <laughs> and the way you went. So that was, uh, and, and nowadays fortunately they, they fly people overseas, but uh, it was, uh, as every place, it was an interesting experience. <laughs> was your dad able to fly directly to Europe, or did you have to take the boat? Uh, no, I think he um, took a boat, a boat too, but I don't know very much about that. <coughs> well, they did fly, fly airplanes over there. They, they went to uh, Gander, Newfoundland. They went up to Gander, Newfoundland, and then to Greenland or Iceland, I've forgotten which. They made a couple stops to refuel. They didn't have the fuel capacity they have now. So they, 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 the number of them were, were ferried, actually ferried planes over. Uh, right. 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 Women right. often flew those planes. Yes, yeah. they did. The, uh, you know, uh, the Will Rod plant was building, what, one an hour? And they would, uh, they would taxi up and down the strip to make sure everything seemed to work. Uh, move the flaps, and if it all looked good, with a woman at the controls, they would fly this route you mentioned. Yeah, why not? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you uh, know anything about that little run uh, bomber plant, but it's built in an L shape. Now, who would build a bomber plant in an L shape, <laughs> other than Henry Ford, <laughs> who <clears throat> was not going to give one tax dollar to Washtenaw County because they voted for Roosevelt. <laughs> and so there was an L in the plant that the plane had to navigate, so that it was all kept in Wayne County, which had not voted for Roosevelt. <laughs> we haven't mentioned uh, Rosie the Riveter yet. By the end of the war, 50% of the workers at the bomber plant were women. And <clears throat> but uh, the reason When we went overseas, there were five decks in the Aquitania, which uh, was a sister ship of Queen Elizabeth. And we'd get up in the morning and work our way through the line up to the fifth deck, fill our, our mess kits, go down to the bottom, and get in line for lunch. And the same thing, lunch for dinner, go down and that's what kept you busy every day, walking around and around the ship to get something to eat. Does anybody remember another forgotten war? How long the fighting was going on in Italy before the invasion of France? Mm -hmm. And yep. you, guys, you guys were bogged down by the mountains. It was a terrible terrain. We were fighting in Italy for nine solid months before the invasion of France, and then we were totally forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there was always one mountain ahead of you, and the main thing, anybody that tells you about sunny Italy is full <laughs> you know what. I can remember Italy is rain and mud and rain and mud and more rot mud <laughs> more rain. I brought my dog tags here in case anybody has never seen dog tag. And I have some other things in, in these folders that I brought. Uh, medals and uh, there's a letter here from Truman and other things that, that he's, uh, by the way, on my hat here is combat infantry badge on this side. On this side, <coughs> mm -hmm. 
is a bronze star. And I have the original bronze star right here. If anybody wants to look at it, they're welcome to look at it. Now, you gave your father's awards, his uniform, and his pristine operator's manual for the B-24 to the Yankee Air Force Museum, right? Yeah, that's a wonderful um, uh, initiative, if those of you who don't know it. Uh, the um, the um, effort that's been made to save the, the remaining history, there was a fire at Willow Run and a lot was destroyed, but they have made an incredible effort to, to come back from that. And um, to not only create a museum, but to keep the B-17 in the air. You can fly on it. If you're interested in really having an a, a, a authentic experience, you can pay a modest amount and you can fly in the B-17. I think it's one of two that are left mm -hmm. in flying today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in beautiful condition. Uh, they have a wonderful pilot. Um, and they are very interested in, at, at Yankee Air Force Base, uh, or Yankee Air Museum, I should say, um, the letters, other things besides, not only the uniforms and so on, but the, but the, the, the knowledge. And they have uh, taken Dad's letters, which are going to be transcribed by uh, Eastern Michigan University students. And they'll be available online and so on, because there's so much information. Huge job. So we were very grateful for that. How many of you are either enrolled at the University of Michigan or are graduated, graduates of the University of Michigan? <clears throat> so do you guys know that the advanced bomb site uh, in World War II was done by University of Michigan faculty? Okay, there we go. Do you know that the submarine threat in the North Atlantic was more or less almost virtually ended by a professor of mathematics at the University of Michigan? Mm -hmm. So this, this university has contributed hugely to uh, both World War II and since then. And in fact, uh, all the weapons that we saw with such awe in Gulf War I and since then, the weapons that never seem to miss come out of the University of Michigan. So the good news is with the Cold War being gone, I don't think we're any longer a top priority target for um, Russia nuclear attack, which we were for the Soviet Union. So that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is North Korea. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure their missile is not going to hit what it's aimed at. It's going to hit something. I have a client who worked on the Manhattan Project in Chicago. And uh, that's the uh, Manhattan Project is for the atom bomb. And uh, that's a question I get in some of my talks to high schools, is that what do you think of now that you, about the atom bomb? Do you think we should have dropped it or not? And I tell them that it took the Japs five days to, to surrender. We would have lost, if it was five weeks, we would have lost a lot more GIs than we did. And also, all you had to do was go through one concentration camp, which I went through two of them. And uh, that solidifies your opinion of dropping the yeah. end bomb. Yeah. Monday morning quarterback is pretty good by these people who never were in the armed forces, never got shot at in it. <laughs> <laughs> Casualty projections for the invasion of Japan without a nuclear weapon were, I think, 10 million. Mm -hmm. Not that high? It was pretty high. I think it was a million on the million. U.S. side and probably three to four million on okay. the Japanese side. Yeah. I stand corrected. It's still yeah. a significant number. Yeah, it's still a very significant number. I left Italy after being there for two years, heading for Manila to get ready for the invasion of Japan. We left Italy on the day the Japanese surrendered. And when we passed Gibraltar, we were to go through the Panama Canal. When we passed Gibraltar, we got orders to go to New York 
Nobody complained. <laughs> <laughs> I was in. Uh, yes, of course. I, I think the end of the war is an interesting story, at least for me. Uh, I was in a boxcar, and uh, <clears throat> it was about, oh, I don't know, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'd been, been up since 5 or something doing what I've been doing, but I was back at the boxcar, and a plane flew over a little later than 8 o'clock, probably. Talk or something like that in the morning, and it was a B-17 at about 5,000 four, uh, less than that, 2,500, 3,000 feet. Was, the war was on. And I saw this guy, and I thought he's in trouble. He's in a crash. He, they were not right over me. He was probably a half a mile away. <clears throat> and the Bombay doors opened, and I, I thought, Jesus, he's going to ditch his bombs right here, and the out came these things, and they burst open, and it was thousands of leaflets. And uh, I remember the war, war was on for me. And there was a German kid, little German kid standing there, about eight or nine years old. They were always wanted chocolate or chewing gum, chocolate or kalgumi. And uh, I said, Gehen Sie ganz schnell und bringen Sie mir ein Papier. Well, it's big too quick, so you can't get me a, one of those papers for chocolate. And he went and but he came back and announced it to, to everybody that the war had ended to stop shooting. That's the way I found out the war ended. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, by a leaflet, I had anything from headquarters. I found out the war was ending. By that. But I got home. To speak to what he was talking about, what Bill was talking about. I got home. And my mother had me, had us for dinner. I was married, my wife and I, for dinner, and a bunch of people there. And she said, <clears throat> don't you think it was terrible that President Truman dropped that atomic bomb on Japan? And I said, Mom, it was the greatest thing that ever happened. I said, when that happened with a bunch of guys, we were all standing there yelling and cheering. And she said, well, I think that's awful, awful. And I said, well, how many lives is my life worth to you? How many, how many people would you get rid of to save my life? That's the question you ask yourself in war. How, much, how many lives would you take to save the guy next to you? Or him to save you? And, and I think that was a, a difficult, difficult decision, decision for President Truman, but I, I doubt if he pondered very long. Even so, <clears throat> one Japanese general said, they've only got two, let's not surrender. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. they were tough. Yeah. Now, I saw some hands in the back here. Question. <coughs> so, I was just wondering, what was like the portrayal of the enemy, like when you were like overseas, like in, on the front? <coughs> uh, like, did, were you conscious of like the humanity of the Germans, or did you even talk about them, or? What, what was the question? What? <coughs> well, how did you? How did you perceive the humanity of the enemy? Yeah. Did you? I'll, I'll speak to that. You did. I found that, that uh, I, I was concerned about whether the public was going to knife us in the back at night or so on. I didn't find that at all. I, I found the German populace that was left to be, to be uh, cooperative. I never. I never, they were beaten, they knew they were beaten, and uh, I had a couple of incidents with some of the diehard Nazis, but other than that, I, I got along, I thought, well, I didn't worry much about it. But you were in a shooting war. And well, they so were trying, they were trying to destroy you, mm -hmm. so you were going to destroy them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the old story, I think. General Robert Lee, 160 years ago, said, war is hell. And it is. It's pretty damn miserable way, and the best way in the world to deter war is to be so doggone strong that nobody's going to fool around with you. Amen. I have a comment on that. I just volunteered after VE Day to be part of Eisenhower's